the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Sparazdikum. On this joyous day, we celebrate our Lord and God and Savior, Jesus Christ's ascension from earth to heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father. And as we were saying yesterday on the leave-taking of Pascha, and we heard in the Acts of the Apostles today, Christ spent those 40 days following his resurrection to give, as it said, infallible proofs of his resurrection, that he was truly raised from the dead to his disciples, to confirm them, assure them, and give them the peace of mind that he had come back from the grave, that he had conquered death. And when those 40 days were completed, he returned to the Father by ascending, by being caught up from the earth to the right hand of the Father. And it says that even then, at that moment, when he gathered his disciples on the mountain to ascend to heaven, St. Matthew tells us in his gospel, it's hard to believe, he says, the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed them, and when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Still, some doubted. What exactly did they doubt, though? Did they doubt his resurrection from the dead, but they had seen him, they had eaten with him, they had felt him, they had touched him, they had spoken with him. Well, the fathers tell us that one of the reasons that we celebrate this feast today, one of the reasons that Christ carried out this action, this sort of dramatic action of ascending to heaven, was to confirm and overcome any doubt we might have in his divinity. He spent those 40 days confirming in us the belief that he had truly risen from the dead. But God could clearly have risen anyone from the dead. He could have risen any one of us had we died. The resurrection is not a proof of his divinity, but simply that he had conquered death, or in him God had conquered death. And yet, by this, by his ascension to heaven and sitting at the right hand of the Father, which is repeated over and over again at the end of Mark, in Acts, and uh, St. Stephen, as he's being stoned, looks into heaven and sees a vision of Christ sitting at the right hand of God the Father. This was the proof of his divinity, of his oneness with God the Father. This was a proof, as the, event, uh, as the holy prophet uh, Isaiah said, and we, as we heard in the reading last night, that it was not an angel or an ambassador, but the Lord himself who became incarnate in Christ. And now as we see the man Christ rising to heaven, we realize that this is truly God, who sits now at the right hand of the Father. Secondly, when we think of the reasons for why Christ did this, why is it he had to depart? Why couldn't he have just stayed here for the rest of eternity to prove to be a witness to the fact that he has risen from the dead? And here again, Christ gives us the answer. He tells us, as we heard in the gospel today, that he departs so that he may send unto us the promise of the Father, that he may send the Holy Spirit to us. And we spend these next 10 days in preparation for the festal celebration of that event, of the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Liturgically, I always feel that these 10 days are sort of like being caught in a sailboat with no wind at sea. For, for all this period after the resurrection, we've been starting the services with the beautiful hymn, Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the tombs bestowing life, sung three times. And then usually throughout the year, we start our services with this prayer, O Heavenly King, the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth. And at this point, though, we're in this sort of vacuum between those two. Christ has departed. The Holy Spirit has not yet come. But we look and rejoice at the glory of Christ ascending to heaven, proving to us his divinity, his oneness with the Father. And we look forward to and prepare ourselves so that when the Holy Spirit comes, we will be ready to be recipients of him. And finally, St. Leo the Great, the Pope of Rome, tells us, Christ, by departing from us in his ascension, has made himself present to us more abundantly, not less so. Because now his presence has transferred over, not just from 
one body that is standing in one place at one time, but now has passed over into the sacraments, into the whole life of the church, into each and every one of us. Christ has risen from earth to heaven and sits now at the right hand of the Father, but he is more present to us than he was then before. He who was everywhere present and filling all things and condescended to take human flesh upon himself, now as a man sits at the right hand of God the Father and yet fills all things and is present everywhere. And he has granted to us, to our human nature, that which God had always intended for us, that we would be in communion with him, that we would be sitting in his midst, that we would share in a likeness, in a oneness, in it being fulfillment of his image. He's fulfilled for us what the serpent of old temptingly tried to promise us, that if Adam and Eve would just eat of this fruit of the tree, they would become like God. And obviously we know that that was not the way to become like God. Christ, though, has shown us the way to become like God, and therefore, even in his humanity, he is the full likeness and image of the Father. And he grants the possibility to us to be so as well. And he sits, as it says in Scripture, at the right hand of the Father. <clears throat> now we are good to remember, as the fathers point out over and over again, that the right hand of God the Father is not a place. You can't type it into your Google Maps and get directions for what altitude you have to fly to and, okay, get up here and now take a little slight to the right, and that is where Jesus is sitting. But the right hand of the Father is a symbol, is a sign of his equality. When I sit at a dinner table, the person I ask, come here, come here, come sit right next to me, right here. Well, if I'm at home, it's actually my son's, but... Um, if I'm, you know, out to eat and I call someone specifically and ask them to sit there, that's because I want to share a very, you know, intimate relationship with them. There's to be a oneness, a communion between us. And to sit at the right hand of the throne is to show that you have been equally endowed with power or authority or a place of preeminence. And so this is a symbol to us to remember that he is not just a creature not just a subject of God. He is God himself, the Son of the Father of one essence and of, of like, um, of one essence and now fulfilling in his humanity even the likeness of God. And yet, this ascension is not something that we just stand by and watch. As the angels said to the men at that time, as we heard in the reading from the book of Acts, the angel said to those that were gathered there that day, Ye men of Galilee, why do you simply stand by gazing into the heavens? And they say that to us as well, because this ascension was not something that was simply affected or enacted in Christ, but he, doing it in his human nature, has brought about a change for us as well. I want to read to you what St. Paul's reflection on this. In his epistle to the Ephesians, he begins to speak about the power of God in the resurrection of Christ, and he starts by talking specifically of Christ. In, his first, in the first chapter of his epistle, he says, of the exceeding power of God toward us who believe according to the working of his power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principalities, powers, mights, and dominions, and every name that is named not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And so he speaks first of Christ, but note, as we turn the page and come to the next chapter, he says, and you, my readers, my listeners, you has he, has he also made alive, raised from the dead. He raised Christ from the dead, he raises us from the dead of our sins. For you were dead in trespass and sin, those in which you walked according to the course of this world and the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who works in the sons of disobedience. And among them all you conducted yourselves in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling its desires and the, of the desires of the flesh and the mind, and you were by nature the children of wrath, just as the others. 
But God, being rich in mercy, for his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. So the same resurrection that happened to Christ happens in us. And listen further. Made us alive together with Christ and raised us up together and made us, interestingly, it's a past tense verb, not will make us, made us to sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So this is something that is to take place in us as well, not simply in Jesus, not simply in our Lord and God and Savior Christ. But how is this done? Christ has done everything in himself to make this a reality, to restore our communion to the Father, to open up a pathway through from earth to heaven, and to prepare a place for us to sit in the presence of God. But we have to do our part as well. As is everything in the church, it is a synergia, a co-working between our will and the will of God. And so St. Paul says elsewhere, in his letter to the Colossians, he tells us, If you have been raised with Christ, seek then those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on the things of this earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. So what he is telling us is, if we have died in Christ, in baptism, by being united to him there, having received the gift of the Holy Spirit, and being prepared for a new life, if we have died in Christ, then we can no longer live in the life of this world, but we must live as if we are sitting right there with Christ in the heavens, so that when he returns from the heavens, we will be numbered among those who are gathered together with him. We will be seen to be those who are of one, nest, na one nature with him, of a like image with him. And how are we to do this? And I, I won't read the full description that St. Paul gives us to, to us here, but I commend it to you to read the third chapter of Colossians today and to meditate on this and how we can practice this. But what he tells us is that we have to first cast off our sins, the things of this world, the things that tie us down, and then begin to practice the virtues. And I like to think of this in the image of a hot air balloon. A hot air balloon, when it's tethered to the ground, weighed down by sandbags, will go nowhere. It'll stay there. You can put all the fuel, all the flame you want, but it is pinned to the ground. And this is what our nature is like. Our nature wants to, it longs to ascend with Christ to heaven, to sit at the right hand of the Father with him, to be there in the presence of the angels, but we are pinned down by our desires for the things of this world, by lusts, by anger, by, uh, by greed, by envy, by bitterness and despair and all these things that weigh us down. And that's why we come to confession, and confession is like the scissors or the saw that cuts the rope that tethers the hot air balloon to the ground. But then, once the balloon begins to rise, if it is really to take off and to ascend, you have to fuel the fire. You have to heat the flame so that it raises it up and lifts it and makes it more buoyant. And this is what our practice of the virtues does for us. Because after cutting away the tethers of anger and greed and envy and lust and all of these things, we have then to fill ourselves with the fuel of chastity, of love, of patience, of humility, of long-suffering, of these things. And these will then raise us up because these are the image of Christ and this is what buoyant, made his human flesh buoyant to rise up with him to sit at the right hand of the Father. And in all of this, we prepare ourselves then for what we confess in the creed time and time again, that we look ultimately to the second coming of Christ. Christ is departed from our midst by ascending to heaven, but not to leave us forever. We have the assurance that he will return to us once more. And this is what the angels also say to us then. For they said to the men that were gathered there that day on the Mount of Olives when Christ ascended from earth to heaven, they said, Ye men of Galilee, 
Why do you stand here gazing into the heavens? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, he will in like manner come down once more as you saw him go. And so we look forward then to that day when Christ will return. And as St. Paul tells us in his letter to the Thessalonians, he will appear in the heavens and the dead will be raised, and we will be caught up. We, too, will ascend up to be with him, and then to usher him in to his kingdom, to walk forward with him in a great procession into that age that will not end. And so, brothers and sisters, then, on this day, as we glorify our Lord, risen from the dead, true God, true man, ascending now from earth to heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father, let us glorify and worship him, but let us more and more strive to imitate him, to raise up our minds and our hearts, as we say in the liturgy, to lift them up to heaven where he is, to have our treasure there where he is, to strive to live a life that raises us up to heaven so that we will know that we can have a good judgment when he returns in like manner. Sprazikam.